Lindsay? Casey? I'm good. How's everybody hanging in there today? Turn on her mic, please, Casey. It should be on. Can you hear me? Big weekend tonight. <laughs> yeah. Big weekend at yeah. the University of Cincinnati. It should be fun. It should be fun. It is my roommate's birthday today, so shout out to her. she about 17? 23. 23, okay. So, yeah, we'll go out to dinner, and then we're going to go out to Tin Roof, so it should be fun. Very nice. It's down along the banks. Yes. Okay. Right, right. outside Casey, the banks. Casey, we had yeah. your bachelor party on the banks. Yeah, we did. Among other stops. Yeah. Later, you... the casino. Oh, yeah. Yep. That was a great night. Uh, you got to meet some of our favorite fans, like yep. Sir Boy. Yeah, and... great. Tomas, your buddy, Tomas, best yep. man in your wedding. That's right. Had a great time down there. I haven't been back down there much since for a while. I don't know why. Oh, well, hi again, everybody. We welcome you, as always, to Dialed In. I'm Tom Brenneman. We come your way twice a week. We are live on Mondays at 9.15 a.m. here on Chatterbox Sports. And then later that day, we post on the Believe Network. Now, Fridays, we're on both Believe and Live on Chatterbox Sports at noon, a little afternoon. The guy's got to get out of here after uh, off the bench. You can join us uh, on YouTube, Chatterbox Sports page. You can download us anytime, anywhere you get your podcast. Just search off, uh, just search Dialed In with Tom Brenneman and you're dialed in. Now, Fridays, we'd like to do a big interview. We're going to have an interview today. I mean, we've had Chip Carey and Chris Myers, and we've had Justin Williams talking about the whole NCAA college football playoff, NIL, Barry Rosner. But Charlie Goldsmith from Cincinnati.com will join us in a matter of minutes to talk about both the Reds and the Bengals. You can follow us on X at Tom Brenneman TV. It's great to have you with us. Thanks. All right. We're only one week into the season, and so far, pretty good for the Red Legs. Four wins in six games, two series, two series wins. Now, this isn't earth-shattering, four and two, but consider the fact that the Reds have not had a winning record over the first month of a season. Going back to 2013, I mean, two years ago, they were 3-22. and 22. But I tell you what, let's play a little bit of the good, the bad, and the ugly for the first week. We're going to do this every week. The good, the bad, and the ugly. For those of you old enough to remember, one of the great movies of all time starring Clint Eastwood. Lindsay has no idea who Clint Eastwood is. Do you? I actually do. You do? I do. I haven't well, watched any of his movies, but I do know. Maybe, maybe the single greatest actor of all time. Maybe. And then he later became producer, director of movies, and all kinds of movies. Violent stuff, Dirty Harry, that's where he really made his name back in the 70s. All the way to, like, uh, The Bridges of Madison County. It's a very romantic, it's a beautiful story. Uh, and he directs a lot of those films. And, I mean, his stuff, if any movie ever comes out and Clint Eastwood is a director of the movie, just go to it. I promise you, you will not be let down. Anyway, all right, good, bad, and the other. The good, Frankie Montas. Through three starts, he has been everything you could ever ask for. He's throwing strikes. He's being pitch efficient. He's getting people out. He's pitched like a number one starter. So that's the good. The bad, the offensive starts for the entire team, not named Martini, Steer, or Fraley. Encarnacion Strand has had some timely hits, big hits, game winner. But Benson, to a lesser extent, Ellie, Candelario, Stevenson, these guys got to start to hit. And they got to start to hit soon. And then there's the ugly, the defense. The Reds starting pitching last year, we talked about this all the time. It was bad. It was in the bottom five in Major League Baseball. And because of that, the bullpen was overused after being great up until about the last month and a half of the season, and the wheels fell off. You can say what you want about the bullpen near the end, say what you want about the starting pitching throughout the whole year. The reason the Reds did not make the playoffs last season was because of bad defense. If you cut their error total down, I'm guessing by about 10, they're in the playoffs. Maybe fewer than that, without a doubt. The number one reason. And the defense is not any good this year. Now, granted, they get a little rope here. They're without two outstanding defenders in McLean and Friedel. But this is not a good defensive team. Reds are back at it tonight. They take on the New York Mets to open a three-game weekend series. The Mets lost their first five games before finally winning yesterday 2-1 
over the Detroit Tigers. Jose Quintana, we've seen him many, many times before. He'll start it for the Mets. Hunter Green on the mound for the Red Legs. The Reds sit a full game behind Pittsburgh for first in the NL Central and a half game behind second place Milwaukee. Women's Final Four tonight in Cleveland. I tell you, this whole thing is unbelievable, this women's basketball thing. Going back two years when this show started, you've heard me talk about me coaching my sons and daughters basketball teams from the time they were in kindergarten all the way to the time they were in seventh grade. If you have a daughter or a granddaughter or a sister or whatever that plays sports, you can fall in love with women's sports. But if you don't, a lot of people don't. But this Caitlin Clark, and there's been good women's basketball for a while now, but what this woman has done to college for college basketball is mind-boggling. Their ratings are insane. And tonight it's the Final Four, which, by the way, it's in Cleveland. And this is the kind of thing that we miss out on by not having an arena. We lost out to Cleveland for the Republican convention four years ago. I don't care about the politics. It's a lot of people in town spending a lot of money. And now Cleveland has a women's Final Four. Let's be honest. I mean, seriously. And and I always say good things about Cleveland, okay? But there is zero contest comparing the downtowns of Cleveland and Cincinnati. N-U-N, none. No contest. First game, it'll be South Carolina taking on NC State at 7. Then at 9, the aforementioned Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes against UConn. Title game is Sunday at 3 o'clock Eastern time on ABC. The men take center stage tomorrow in Glendale, Arizona. Cinderella, NC State. Who's not rooting for NC State? Seriously. It's a good Cinderella. You have to have a pulse. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. Who's rooting for any of those other teams? Seriously, I'm I'm are not. you? No, I'm not. I'm looking at uh, the the what, what is the big guy's name? DJ Burns. I, yeah, I'm rooting leader for, of men. I'm looking for Burns to maybe uh, hit up in the NFL draft. They're they're evaluating him. Yeah, he might be an offensive lineman. I know it. I tell you, I've, uh, how could you not fall in love with that dude? I mean, he has just been unbelievable to watch. Now, I like Purdue too. I will say, I'd be okay if they won it. But the other two, yeah. All right. So you've got Purdue, NC State. 6.09 tomorrow, the nightcap defending champion UConn takes on Alabama. Winners meet Monday night. Bronny James is entering the NBA draft slash transfer portal. Now, his freshman year at USC was interrupted by a cardiac condition. He only played 19 minutes a game, average four points, two rebounds. Where he's going, we'll see. FCC hosts the New York Bulls Saturday night at TQL Stadium. FCC hasn't lost a game. No, they haven't, Tom. They've tied three, but they haven't lost the game. They have the most points in the Eastern Conference. They were Eastern Conference regular season champions a year ago. All right. uh, As we said, Charlie Goldsmith, Cincinnati.com, kind enough to join us, our good friend of the program. Charlie, uh, you know, everybody was talking about, first of all, how are you? Hope you're doing well. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You know, I, I, I heard everybody, you wrote about it. We've talked about it. Everybody was talking about how important a fast start was for the Reds this season. And and maybe even more so when you knew you were going to be without McLean and Friedel for a while. Uh, And now it's only two series. It's only six games. But you're four and two. Macro standpoint, what have you seen? I played the good, the bad, and the ugly. What have you seen that you like? What have you seen that you're a little, little worried about? I think the headline of the first week of the season is the starting pitching staff out. Everyone has had a successful start. I know Hunter Green didn't blow the doors off uh, in his season debut, but a lot of that was the uh, the defense behind him. Nick Martinez was more solid than flashy, but as a whole, you know, you'll take this one through five plus two starts for Frankie Montas. You'll take that. You'll sign up for that on the dotted line at the beginning of the season, especially when you factor in just how aggressive and in control Montas is, how much Graham Ashcraft's two-seam was working, how Andrew Abbott looked on a day where his fastball wasn't even at its best, how Hunter Green battled in some adverse situations. You know, they drop pop flies, and he keeps throwing good pitches. So all of that as a whole, definitely the headline. Concerned about the defense. Jamer Candelario hasn't been the start you wanted to see. Um, some ups and downs from Ellie De La Cruz. But as a whole, 4-2, and two, you know, a really tough series win with a you know, high degree of difficulty in Philadelphia. Good start to the year so far. 
Um, you know, I, I'm kind of curious, and again, it's only um, one start for um, everybody but Montas. Um, and, and, you know, Ashcraft and Abbott both look very good. As we know, next week, April the 10th, I believe, is a day, correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. that's the day that Nick Lodolo is supposed to come back. So we know that Montas isn't going anywhere. We know Hunter Green isn't going anywhere. Okay, and then I just mentioned Ashcraft and um, um, Abbott. Martinez is a guy who has pitched a lot in the bullpen, but I think it's safe to say you've talked to the guy, Charlie. He, he'd rather be a starter. Is that right? He, he likes to start. He prefers to start, but he, he's the kind of guy who actually means it when he says I'll do whatever for the team. He recognize, This is kind of how he's made his career, being a guy who can actually do both. That's what he's getting paid to do, to do whatever the Reds tell him next week. So you suspect that he would be the guy uh, that probably ends up just moving into the bullpen and then they just keep Abbott Lodolo hanging around in the store? I mean, uh, Abbott and Ashcraft in the rotation? So to me, it comes down to Abbott and Martinez. I'll say give it one more start if okay. Andrew Abbott does again what he did last week. You know, hey, I'm a general proponent, too. Give me the 13 best pitchers on the staff. Yep. Just like on an offensive line, like give me your five best guys. And I think the starting pitching depth gives the Reds the flexibility to move Martinez to the bullpen. But even if he is in the bullpen, I think how we'll see him get used is multi-inning high leverage. So, like, Frankie Montas left that game the other day with, like, two runners on and two outs in the sixth, maybe, yep. maybe the fifth. Uh, the fifth sounds right. Martinez would come in, finish that inning, and, like, go one or two more. So I think that's how you would see Nick Martinez get used if the status quo plays out. If it doesn't, if Martinez blows the doors off in his next start, then yeah, let's have a conversation about maybe sending Andrew Abbott to AAA for the time being. But as of right now, I think I'd lean with uh, Martinez in the bullpen. Uh, You know, it's interesting you say that about Martinez and how theoretically he would be used because the Reds have played six games and Brent Suter's already pitched in four. And and if I were a betting man, the reason that that has happened is because they don't have somebody – from the right side that is basically him, right? I mean, Suter's a guy you're hoping that could give you two and two-thirds, inning and two-thirds, two innings here and there coming out, not four out of six games. But you'd have another option for that sort of role uh, if Martinez does indeed go to that bullpen because I don't know who fills that role if you send Abbott to the minor leagues, keep Martinez in the rotation, put Lodolo in the rotation, I don't know if they have anybody else that could technically fill that void and, and not run Suter out there every day of the week. Well, then it would just be more of the status quo what they've already been doing. Like, most teams don't have one of those guys, let alone two, so there are definitely yeah. ways they could survive. I, the bullpen probably hasn't been getting enough credit. Like, I think that Fernando Cruz genuinely just looks like a really good pitcher, and I think that's going to sustain Lucas Sims is as sharp as he's been. Um, sticking with the right-handers, um, you know, Ian Jabot will come back. He was a high-leverage guy for them last year. So, like, they have right-handed relievers. Buck Farmer and TJ Antoine probably on the lower leverage side of things. But, you know, if you're going to ask one guy to develop into that multi-inning guy, you would want that to be Antoine, but he's not quite there yet just when you look at how he's pitched. So Martinez would help, but I also don't think it's a necessity um, based on, you know, the length they do have in Suter and then just the amount of guys they have who could pitch high leverage. Okay, let's talk about the offense for a minute. I made the comment a second ago that um, – that, you know, outside really of Martini, and, and in many ways it's opening day, but let, let's just put him aside, put Fraley aside. He's off to a really nice start. Uh, and Steer, of course, who I, I still maintain is the best offensive, most consistent offensive player they have on this team, despite people getting excited about other people, and rightfully so. Uh, but some of these other guys, uh, Encarnacion Strand has, has gotten big hits. He doesn't have many, but he's got a couple of big ones, that's for sure. Uh, in Philadelphia against Wheeler the other night, the game-winning home run um, to win the last game of that Washington series. Um, do, you, you know, do you, are, is there anybody you're watching and you say, yeah, we're only s- six games in, but even throwing in a little spring training and you're saying to yourself, hmm, little, little worry. You're not going to hit the panic button a week into a three-year with a team option contract. But, I mean, you have to start with Jamer Candelario, especially factoring in his spring training. Here's what's so interesting to me. Jamer Candelario, the number one line on his scouting report that the Reds bought into, that the Reds believe in, he works a professional at bat. He's very tough to get out. 
when you look at the Jamer Candelario that has been on the field for the Reds over this last week, Jamer Candelario was striking out a ton. That just hasn't been him. And that's what's so kind of strange or, or, you know, it, it's hard to put your finger on. How does a hitter who really doesn't strike out or chase that much doing that at this level and not and not putting together tough at-bats at all? He's usually elite against fastballs. He is now like, just not good uh, against fastballs. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one thing I'm going to be following and paying attention to. Obviously something that Reds need to get sorted out with the way they're infield in their lineup is structured. Where are they with the injury stuff? You know, I, I, I always say all the time, and I don't mean this in a negative way towards anybody or anything. Uh, I just think that because of current laws and HIPAA and all of a sudden that kind of thing, that we're, we're so limited to what we can really find out about guys' injuries, regardless of sport. Um, the McLean thing to me, and, and I had heard a lot of backstory about this whole thing through a few sources of mine, um, any clarity? Because it's been very, very vague about what kind of timeline we're looking at with this guy. I would project four to six months. So, like, there's a window. Um, the reason it has been vague is just because the nature months. of the injury. You happened. said months. Months. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, it's been – well, he's on the 60-day IL, so he's not returning until June anyway. The reason it's been vague is because, like, the word cartilage has gotten used a lot with this injury. Cartilage is soft, right? And it's not like there was something – there was a clean break or, or there's a very clear, you know, X, Y, Z. Like, TJ Friedel's kind of X, Y, Z. Um, uh, McLean has another follow-up, and they're just going to get more information. They need more information before they can have a specific timeline and recovery and process going forward, all that stuff. Again, like cartilage is very soft, and soft means tricky. Um, that's kind of why it's been such a fluid timetable with McLean. Okay, uh, Friedel, I mean, his, like you said, I mean, his is a broken bone. They, they, they figure it'll be, what, a month maybe, a little bit longer than that for him? Early May was the expectation. I do get the sense they could just like take it easy uh, yeah. because the number one thing that everyone, including people who have had the injury, is stressed is the worst thing you could do is rush this. Um, that's mm -hmm. where really bad things happen. Uh, so they might take it easy. But again, like literally the, day's May, the day May 1st has been thrown around. So he continues to make solid progress as well. Okay. I want to ask you very quickly before we let you go, and we appreciate the generosity of your time. Shift gears over to you also cover the Cincinnati Bengals. You know, I, look. Uh, I had never been on uh, social media my entire life um, until I started here at Chatterbox, and I really don't know how to work it very well. And you know, I, but anyway, but I, but I read some of the stuff, uh, especially on X, and people talking about the Bengals are getting ready to make another big move. You know what I'm talking about here, right? This was everywhere two days ago, and I'm thinking to myself, do you think they have big moves left between either now in the draft or now in training camp? Another big move or multiple moves? Big no. They have money to spend. So I think they would love to go out and get a, an experienced number four cornerback. You know, a solid, you know, sick starter level, to, to use a baseball metaphor, like that tier guy. Someone you're willing to throw out there um, for every fifth day. You know what I mean? Um, and can cover innings, but isn't necessarily going to play at a, a starter level, but can get you there and give you some insurance. I think they'd like that. I think they'd like another body at nose tackle. The problem is there's a very weak class of nose tackles available. Maybe is there a cap casualty that comes up, like the Lyle Collins of nose tackles um, with how Lyle kind of came uh, on the market unexpectedly. Those are kind of things they'd like to do. And then, of course, the drafts uh, includes big moves as well. I do think the most talent the Bengals will have between now and the start of the season will come through the draft. I wouldn't expect anything crazy between now and the start of the season. Okay, fair enough. Charlie, we always thank you for your time, my friend. Uh, I assume you'll be down at the big ballpark tonight for the opener against the New York Mets. So uh, hopefully the rain stays away and you have a good weekend down there. Have a good weekend. All right, Charlie Goldsmith. They call him the GOAT in the chat. Have you noticed that, Casey? They want me to start calling him Charlie Goatsmith. I mean, he is the GOAT. I mean, he's great. He's always uh, very informative, very well-spoken, and – Quite frankly, he, he breaks a lot of news around here, and I think he's got a lot of really great takes. I really like him a lot. Charlie Goatsmith? That's what, that's what a like few it. people have said. Uh, Nate, I think, is the one who said it first. Uh, Charlie Goatsmith. Would you like somebody calling you, if your name was Goldsmith, uh, Lindsay, somebody calling you Goatsmith? If they were calling me in the sense of greatest of all time, then yes. You I know, wouldn't mind I'm it. I'm so glad you pointed that out. <laughs> Because, see, I'm surprised you're old enough to even, 
you know, sort of, <laughs> of think of that. What is so funny? Nothing. What is it? Sorry. <laughs> Just Elliot calls her uh, the baby all the time. Mm-hmm. Calls her what? A baby. A baby. A little baby. A little baby. Why a baby? Because you're youth? Because I'm two years younger than him, and he acts like I'm this teenager just walking around. <laughs> but I'm not he a teenager. calls you the baby? Mm-hmm. A whittle baby. A whittle baby. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, You're going to have to talk to him about that. You that. What, Casey? You're going to have to talk to him about that. I do. I got to ask you, though, before we get out of here today, I brought up during the monologue, Lindsay, I'm interested to hear your opinion on this. You're a sports fan, but you're not like over the top sports fan. Is that fair to say? Depending on like the team, I guess. would Yeah. Depending on what the team that we're talking about is. But yeah. OK. Now, we know you're a Steelers fan. Mm-hmm. You like Penn State mm-hmm. and some of that sort of you follow UC. Obviously, it's yeah. your school. OK. But but in a broader sense. Has Caitlin Clark done anything for you wanting to watch women's basketball? Truthfully, yeah. I think, I think women's basketball is finally getting the coverage that it should have been, and I, I guess it sucks it took this long for women's sports to be taken seriously. But I think it's nice that finally, it, it like it's not even just her. Like even the whole her versus Angel Reese, that was a big rivalry, yep. and that game was good fun to watch. Um, Kay, uh, Cameron Brink and like all these other up and comers, so it's kind of fun to watch them. And ha- Haley Van Rith. Yeah, she's something? transferring. Yeah. I yep. saw that. That was in the news today. I, she's yeah. leaving LSU after one year, their star point guard. The yeah. last game for her was brutal. They, she, Kim Mulkey stuck her up against Caitlin Clark, and it was Well, and crazy. I understand she was sick, and she still mm-hmm. played through it. God bless her. I mean, when I hear stories, I, I was. it's funny you say that. I was reading that to some of this stuff this morning about people lighting her up mm-hmm. on social. And I'm thinking to myself, man, <laughs> she was sick. It's not to say she would have stopped Caitlin Clark. Nobody stops Caitlin Clark. The only person who stops Caitlin Clark is take Caitlin Clark, and she's missing shots, right? Right. She's throwing in everything. Like, it's like hitting water, throwing it out of a boat. It was going in. Yeah. I, I mean, I just, I, it makes me sick the way some of these people attack these college. And you can say, well, they're basically pros in college with NIL and everything else. This is a young woman who's 21 years old. She was sick. She's a great player. She had a game where she was guarding arguably the greatest college player in the history of the sport who was just absolutely on fire. And we're going to take the time to light up this young woman. Mm -hmm. She's taken it well, though. She credits credits Caitlin Clark. There's even this one picture of her where Caitlin Clark, I did think, did a three, and she just put her hands up like this because, like, what are you going to do? That's exactly right. Yeah. You're getting a lot of pub here. A lot of pub here. Um... Lindsay, I got to tell you, people saying you're answering like a true professional. <laughs> okay. Well, and then Yash, of course, is all over um, uh, the, the, the girl who got lit up, the woman who got lit up. <laughs> all right. Anyway. Okay. Um, wh- are you guys have any big plans before we get out of here for the eclipse? I don't have any big plans for it. I, it's on a Thursday, right? It's on Monday. Yeah, it's it's Monday on Monday. This four, Monday. Now, I, uh, I've i never seen an eclipse. Every time there's been something like that around here in this area, I've not been able to experience it. I would love to experience it. This would be the one time I'd be able to do it. Uh, I don't think we have too much going on around that time. So I got to get some glasses or something and get to an area where I can actually like experience it. Well, I'm bringing it up because uh, are, are you guys doing off the bench on, on Monday? I imagine so. I got to tell you, I I mean, I've read a bunch of stuff, and I'm really being serious now. I have read all kinds of articles, and I wish one of them would explain to me why. But there are a lot of of people that are really uptight about this uh, eclipse. Yeah, they know it's going to be cool, but I've read about traffic. I've read about all kinds of different things that they're, they're deeply, deeply concerned about that day. And that's why I asked on Monday if there was off the bench. Because they've got, if, you, know, you know those, uh, the, the, those uh, what do you call them, signs they have all over the highway that, you know, they tell you what's going on if there's an accident or whatever it might be. What's the word I'm looking for? I'm just drawing a blank. But they're all over the place about the eclipse. Expect major traffic delays. Expect, I mean, I, anybody understand why that is? Have I think you heard why? 
Well, I think Cincinnati is supposed to be a really good spot to yeah, it see is. the eclipse. The so I think people good, yeah. are dri- a lot of people drive to see this eclipse. I just saw on Twitter from 2017 where it was a bunch of people went like in the cornfields and stuff, and it was all this traffic of all these cars going. And so I think it's just a bunch of people traveling to see the eclipse and to get the best view of it. But cause huh. it's supposed to be a full eclipse, I think, right? Like a yeah. I mean, yeah, this is a like a, a once in a lifetime generation. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of the Nate saying I-75 right down the road from us. That's how we get here. Is going to be a disaster. Because a lot of people are actually traveling to Dayton for the eclipse. My understanding is the best place in this part of the country to go to, and it's going to be insane there, is Bloomington, Indiana. Hmm. I don't know why. Um, Apparently it's uh, – and then they're saying that people are going to stop um, and watch. Um, Nate just points out Cincinnati is going to be 99%. Dayton is going to be a full eclipse. Um. Okay. Well, um, and Mark Fetter saying it's overrated. Well, I just hope everybody <laughs> stays safe. I just hope everybody stays safe. All right. Casey, have a great weekend. Are you going to the Cincinnati FCC game? I am not. I will be doing Miami baseball this yes. weekend. And so. we're doing the big doubleheader uh, Tuesday night. That's right. It rained out last week. Prasco. At Prasco. So That's all classic. We have Wright State against Dayton in one game. Uh, I have the privilege and the honor to be the first baseball game I broadcast since my fateful night four years ago. I'll be doing the UC Xavier game so right here on Chatterbox. So we'll have both of those games for you on Tuesday night. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Take care of yourself. God bless. We'll see you on Monday.